Good afternoon, everybody, and, and welcome to this afternoon's session on Disaster Challenge. Hopefully what we'll do today is give you some information about the challenge that will help you put forward um, some solutions to some very wicked problems for us. I'd like to start today by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we are all sitting today as we join in this workshop, and to acknowledge the traditional owners of those lands, pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and to any traditional owners who are with us today. I'd also like to acknowledge that these lands have been and always will be places of teaching, learning and research. My name's John Bates. I'm the Research Strategy Director at Natural Hazards Research Australia, and I'll be your host for today. The, the, uh, the program for today is, is really designed to tell you a little bit about the disaster challenge. We've got a few guest speakers that will get to talk to you to give you just some ideas about uh, their understanding of why the challenge is wicked and their perspectives on the topic area. Uh, and we'll have a Q&A session at the end. The session is being recorded and will be made available through the Disaster Challenge website um, after this meeting. Uh, getting the slides working. So the, the first thing I, I really wanted to talk through is why did we introduce the Disaster Challenge? And it really was something that we put together because we know that research into natural hazards in Australia and across the world is really well established. But what we want to do is really to tap into different ways of thinking to get some new minds to, into, the, into the thinking that we do, to try and come up with solutions that, that are perhaps different, get different thinking into, what, um, into ways that we can reduce some of the, the trauma, some of the, um, the, the damage and the long-term effects of natural hazards. Because whilst we continue to improve the way that we manage them, continue to reduce the risk to disasters and continue to build re disaster resilience, there's still a long way to go. And really what we're trying to do through the disaster challenge is to come up with some of those solutions that will improve those things. Many of you hopefully will understand what we mean when we talk about wicked challenges, but essentially what we're talking about with wicked problems are things that are urgent, things that, that often are difficult to solve because the requirements are incomplete, because they might be contradictory or changing uh, as things progress through. Often, the, the problems themselves are difficult to recognise and, and perhaps to evaluate to work out why they're happening. And they're also likely to be linked to other factors that influence the effectiveness and the outcomes. And at times changing one thing can lead to changes to other things. So whilst you fix something, something else becomes a little bit broken. So it's trying to understand how do we do that and, and how do we get change that is both beneficial and not something that will just create new problems as we solve something before. The first wicked challenge, um, and this is the first time that we've run this program, is to understand it and really to get your ideas on how can disaster preparation engaged with the unengaged, the moving or the hard to reach. And we will reach into that shortly uh, and explore what that means. But before we do that, uh, I'd like to introduce three guest speakers that we've got for this afternoon. Um, they are people who are very well respected in their field. They've got a lot of experience and they're going to give us each a bit of a perspective. Our first presenter will be Dr. Josh Whitaker. Uh, Josh is a human geographer uh, and currently working with the New South Wales Rural Fire Service and has been a natural hazards researcher for quite some time uh, in the university sector. Our second speaker is Associate Professor Andrew Taylor from the Charles Darwin University. And the final speaker will be Associate Professor Michelle Villeneuve from the University of Sydney. So without further ado, I'd like to pass over to Josh Whitaker, and he will give you his thoughts from someone who works um, in a fire service, but also someone who is a human geographer that's looked at and, and explored human behaviours and human responses to disasters. So Josh, over to you, please. Thanks, John. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as John mentioned, I currently work in the New South Wales RFS community engagement team. And the role of that team is largely to support community preparedness for bushfire and other emergencies. Uh, but before that, I worked uh, as a university researcher, um, most recently at the University of Wollongong, uh, where I specialised in post-incident research uh, for Australian fire and emergency services. Now, you'll all remember the bushfire season of 2019 to 20, no doubt. Um, the worst fire season we've experienced in New South Wales history. Uh, 26 people tragically lost their lives in these fires. Uh, almost 2,500 homes were destroyed and 5.5 million hectares 
uh, of the state was burnt, uh, the, the largest fires and the longest fire season we've seen. So the, the fires triggered a, a state bushfire inquiry and a royal commission, um, which examined, among other things, uh, community preparedness for fires. And these fires were particularly unique and certainly uh, unique in, in the fires that I've studied in that they saw a very large number of tourists and visitors caught up in the fire emergency. So uh, fires on the south coast uh, of New South Wales in particular occurred over the Christmas and New Year period. And this is a time when tens of thousands of people uh, go for their holidays in the coastal towns and villages right up and down the eastern seaboard. So tourists and visitors, of course, um, people on the move, largely unengaged with bushfire and hard to reach both before and during an emergency, as I'll talk about in a moment. So the first thing to note is that uh, the Rural Fire Service was very aware that there were lots of tourists uh, in, in the areas that were predicted to be impacted by the fires. Uh, and for the first time, they issued tourist leave zone messages, which were messages designed to advise tourists and visitors in these areas to either avoid traveling to the areas. Uh, a lot of people were going for their Christmas and New Year holidays, um, or if they were already in these areas to leave. And this was for their own safety, but also to make the job of firefighters and emergency services easier, and also to free up some of those critical resources that uh, local people uh, would need during the emergency. Uh, many people did leave, but of course, many didn't. Um, and thousands of people, both residents and tourists, ended up on beaches and in other open spaces where they, where they found protection from the fires. Uh, and I was fortunate to lead a, uh, a study for the New South Wales RFS and the Bushfire and Natural Hazards C, CRC. And with this work, we surveyed over a thousand people and interviewed over 200, um, about a quarter of which were tourists, visitors and holiday home owners in these areas. So I just want to talk to you about some of the findings and, and the challenges that they pose for us. Um, the main reasons people travel to these areas, not surprisingly, were uh, for a holiday or to visit their family and friends over the Christmas and New Year period. 45% were traveling with children or other dependents. So there's a lot of children um, in, in, in these areas who don't live there. And then the other important thing to look at is the type of accommodation that people were staying in. So you can see that a little over a third there were visiting their own holiday home. So they're different from residents in that they don't live there normally. They don't necessarily have to be there if there's a fire. Um, visiting uh, at friends or family's homes, around 17% uh, were at a campground or a caravan park, which is obviously quite a different type of accommodation. Airbnb and other private holiday rentals, about 12%, and a very small proportion in hotels and motels. So people are out in different locations, different types of accommodation. We looked at the perceived likelihood of a fire occurring before the people left their homes. Um, so this is before they left for their trip. And you can see that um, around 40% thought it was likely or very likely that a bushfire would occur. Around one third thought it was unlikely. A very small proportion hadn't really thought about it. But surprisingly, perhaps, more than a quarter travelled knowing that a bushfire was already burning in, in the area that, or, or near the area that they were going to. And the most common reasons for this uh, that we, we came across both in the survey and the interviews was that either they didn't think they'd be personally affected um, or they just wanted to get on with their holiday. In terms of um, once, once they got there and, and realised that this fire was real, most people took it pretty seriously. So you can see that about two thirds uh, either returned home or left for a, a location outside the tourist leave zone, but around a third stayed within. And this was mostly uh, either they couldn't leave uh, because they couldn't get information uh, and warnings due to uh, telecommunications and power outages, or because their, um, their route home had been blocked by fire. And this was quite common. But people understood that these fires were dangerous and that they needed to protect themselves. And the last little finding I'll, I'll show you is the effect of the fires on 
the households of tourists and visitors. And you can see that, um, you know, more than half of the people reported that a household member felt more nervous or anxious because of their, that, than usual, because of their experience, people feeling more sad and depressed, health issues, particularly around smoke, and some people also reporting relationship strain and financial strain. So the impacts of the fires on these people was quite significant. Very briefly in response, um, New South Wales RFS, uh, Destination New South Wales and Resilience New South Wales have worked collaboratively to respond to recommendation 16 of the New South Wales bushfire inquiry, uh, which re recommended that we work to provide more support to tourism businesses, uh, tourism businesses to help them prepare, respond and recover. Uh, and there's been a series of uh, quick tips guides for uh, tourism businesses uh, that are available on the Destination New South Wales website. But in terms of this, this group of people that are, that are on the move, they're hard to engage, um, what are the challenges? Well, First and foremost, many of the people that we spoke to came from areas where bushfire wasn't a risk. So they had limited awareness and preparedness for fire. Some received conflicting messages about whether it was safe to travel. Uh, awareness of the fires was pretty, pretty widespread, um, more so than we've seen in, in previous fires, just because of the, the, the length of the fire season and the extent of the fires. So people called their tourism um, or their accommodation provider or where they were staying and people said, yep, it's fine, you can come, it's safe, even though the New South Wales Rural Fire Service may have been advising people at that time not to travel. Another challenge is that people aren't, local, uh, aren't familiar with their local areas. They don't know where the neighbourhood safe place is, for example, if they need to seek shelter. Uh, it's more difficult to reach people in private holiday rentals, so Airbnbs, uh, they don't have staff. There's no requirement uh, for them to provide bushfire information. Um, so that's a real challenge going forward, uh, particularly with the growth of that type of holiday rental. English may not be the first language and there may be other issues that uh, need to be taken into account with how we communicate with people. And the final point I'd raise is just that when you're on holiday, and a lot of people told us this, uh, people are tuned out. They're not necessarily listening to the news or the radio. Uh, they're trying to have a nice holiday. So that can present uh, another barrier to engaging with them. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Uh, now I'd like to invite Andrew Taylor to give you a perspective from the Northern Territory. Can you hear me now? Hopefully you can. Andrew Taylor is my name. It's great to be with you. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which my research is conducted, the Larrakia Nation and the Larrakia peoples. And let's get started with some slides, which should appear shortly. Uh, so I'm a demographer, and I guess um, what I wanted to do today was briefly um, talk about these dot points in relation to this challenge that you've all uh, accepted to address through the uh, natural hazards uh, research. Um, Institute. Now, um, what I'm going to do is provide a bit of a, a link between Josh's talk, which was fantastic and a hard act to follow, and perhaps broaden out to the whole nexus between demography and um, planning for uh, mitigating, uh, engaging people around disasters uh, and natural hazards. And of course, what what might happen afterwards is equally important, as equally as important. So just three very uh, three themes for my talk today, um, planning for engagement when essentially we don't know what the population is that might be affected, the challenge of non-residents uh, of which tourists are of course one and the highly mobile that might be found in any place at a given time. Uh, and those that I'm calling lost in space and I'll uh, get to that in a minute. So to start with, um, really as a demographer, uh, if you were to ask me what the population of a place is um, at any given point in time, I could give you probably 20 different answers to that, depending on how we wanted to define it. And here I've tried to sort of distill, and of course that thing, if you want to engage with people around disasters and potential and imminent disasters, uh, that presents a lot of problems. So pretend for example, that you are the disaster coordinator for a region that includes this uh, mythical place called Disaster Town. And a, a, a disaster of some form is about to strike. 
how can you get a quick feel for who is there and who needs to be engaged with in terms of um, mitigating the uh, unwanted effects of this potential disaster? So as demographers, we look at um, uh, several different types of population, as I've alluded to. Now, uh, in disaster town, with this disaster coming, there are the people that are present at this time and also live in disaster town. There are the people that live in disaster town, but who are temporarily away from disaster town, but they could be returning any time. And there are the people who are present at this time in disaster town, but don't usually live here. And they are the non-residents. So the, the sum of the two boxes on the top there are what we call the usually resident population. The sum of the uh, present and living and the non-residents are what we might call the point in time population or it's often referred to as the service population. So when you think about it, um, all of these uh, boxes, all of these people need to be engaged with in different ways um, as Josh has certainly uh, covered in his talk. So moving specifically to uh, the challenge of engaging with non-residents and the highly mobile. Um, in my work, I, I deal a lot in this area because we, uh, because I deal with sparsely populated areas uh, of, of the world and um, we face challenges in understanding um, population numbers and sizes, uh, partly because of these non-resident and highly mobile populations. So who are some of them? Um, well, of course, if you're talking about sparsely populated areas in Australia, they tend to have a high concentration of remote living uh, Indigenous Australians. And there's plenty of research around that shows that Indigenous people in remote areas in Australia, and not just Australia and Canada and, and Alaska and other places, um, undertake uh, short-term mobility at a higher rate than other people. And what I mean by that is that um, it's not residential moves, but these are short-term moves for things that we all move around for, which include uh, things like uh, visiting friends and family, as Josh covered, going on holiday, going to sporting events, um, undertaking cultural uh, obligations and uh, cultural ceremonies. And so we see a lot of um, internal migration in places like the Northern Territory, where I work. Now, this sort of migration is not captured very well by any uh, data collection that we currently have or any data architecture. There are some um, improvements coming with uh, what we call uh, the multi-agency data integration project, which is a national project with several uh, very large data sets being combined. But you're always looking at the past in this sense. Um, and so how do we engage with people like remote living Indigenous Australians uh, who are moving around within their state or territory or across state and territory borders. That's a challenge. Uh, tourists, Josh has covered extremely well, but I'll just add one point that uh, adds to the challenge of dealing with tourists and engaging with tourists in natural hazards. And that is that the ways in which they like to receive information differs depending on who they are. So you've got to cater for tourists uh, of different shapes and sizes. You know, your grey nomads, but also your beachy, trendy people and who are really uh, living up on the beach at a resort or whatever. Um, you've got to get information to tourists in, a, in different ways, depending on the, on the segment that they are. And of course, different places have different segments that are prominent. And then we think about the quite obvious, uh, perhaps more obvious, difficult to engage uh, populations that might be in a certain place at a certain time. And they include naturally the long distance workers. So people who are uh, at a place may be affected and impacted by disasters or hazards, um, but don't live there, but they're there for work. And it's not just the obvious ones of flying, fly out and driving, drive out that we tend to think about, um, but there are a lot of people in the Northern Territory, for example, working in government who are uh, up for temporary contracts. Um, there are a lot of people in the building and construction industry around Australia, a lot of tradies moving around. So um, getting a handle on how many, who they are and how to engage with them, how to contact them is uh, no small feat. And when you add together all three of these uh, subpopulations, if you like, that might be uh, present in your town or city, uh, the challenge is certainly significant and uh, 
and uh, I, we look forward to seeing how you're going to resolve all that. Lastly, uh, the people who are lost in space. Now, a uh, bit of shameless promotion for some research we did here. Um, you'll recall that uh, a lot of the early talk when the COVID-19 pandemic arrived on our doorstep was around getting Australians home and Australians who wanted to come home but couldn't. And, um, you know, in the end, that ended up with people who were uh, lost in space in India just being completely shut out. And, you know, I think it's fair and reasonable to say that, that uh, the legacy of, of that sort of action did carry over to the recent election. Um, at least, you know, I, I feel that that's the case. Um, we don't know how many Australians at any point in time are overseas and where they are. And so this article was really a call for a better data set around that uh, to implement some fairly simple ways of just understanding how, how we can contact and engage with people, Australians who are overseas for when the next uh, global uh, pandemic or the next global catastrophe does strike and we wanna get Australians home. Um, so uh, last of all, uh, I wanted to uh, very briefly deal with a more broader sense of who are problem people in our communities in general. This is right around Australia. So here we have the diff uh, here we have what's called the net undercount rate for the census. What it shows us quite clearly um, is that um, people that tend not to engage with official lines of communication and tend to actually disengage are very much the uh, sort of 20 to 30 year olds, and this might not come as a surprise to any of you, but especially so for males. So when we talk about engaging um, with, with populations and, and with people around natural hazards, we have to keep in mind that we might need different strategies uh, depending on sort of life stage. So I would call this, these aged people, so people aged in their 20s to 30s, I would call them early career people. Different strategies are needed for early career people uh, than from say uh, retirees. And uh, again, this throws another challenge out to you and, and out to uh, people who hope to engage around uh, natural hazards. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for listening. And I'll turn the uh, presentation back to John. Thanks, Andrew. And we'll pass straight over to Michelle. Hello, everyone, and uh, thanks for having me here today. Um, I'll get straight into it. And I think um, it's almost like we've planned this. Uh, I'll take you to yet an even broader uh, picture. Uh, disability stigma is the single biggest barrier uh, to the safety and well being of people with disability in emergency situations. I mean, you might ask, why is that? Um, and frankly, it's because people with disability have been overlooked, excluded, and quite often an afterthought in our emergency management planning processes at the local community level um, and supported or creates problems for support in the recovery process. You'll see here Peter and Christy on the screen. Peter's a disability advocate and Christy's an emergency planner um, with council. Um, they started a conversation to try and remedy this problem um, about people with disability being overlooked. And they began a conversation that went something like this. Christy said, hey, Peter, I'd really like to talk with your, uh, your peer support group and get some more information. But what I'll do first is I'll do my research and I'll do the legwork and I'll create a draft document and then I'll come and speak with you uh, about what your views are. And Peter said, stop right there, Christy. <laughs> um, you need to speak with us first. Uh, you're not wasting our time. We want to be included right from the outset. That conversation sparked an incredible learning journey uh, uh, that Christy has gone on together with Peter and his peer support group uh, to change the situation for disability inclusion in Ipswich Council's uh, emergency management planning process. Now, this is typically where emergency planning starts. If you're an emergency manager, this is what you're concerned about. How prepared are people for emergencies and do they have a plan in place? This is often accompanied by information about um, Oh, flood inundation maps, uh, ap apocalyptic images, sometimes a fire. And some of these things can be quite traumatizing for people to think about and make them bury their head in the sand instead of getting started. If you have a disability or you provide care and support to someone with a disability, this can be quite overwhelming to think about how prepared am I? Because people with disability face social and um, personal barriers um, that make it much harder for them. Their extra support needs need to be considered. 
So we've been doing research together with people with disability to think about what is required for that to happen. The additional support needs that you see on the slide here are embedded in our person-centered emergency preparedness framework. Uh, because what we need to know is people need to, a, a step earlier, before what's your level of preparedness and what's your plan, people need to self-assess how they manage their support needs every day. If we don't understand ourselves, what we're capable of and what we need support for, then we're not going to be able to plan effectively in emergencies. And this is pretty significant for people with disability who have additional extra support needs and, and extra people and equipment and things they need to plan for and around. The problem for us was that in 2015, we just had this idea that we should engage in disability inclusive disaster risk reduction, but it wasn't part of Australia's disaster management lexicon. It really hadn't entered into the vocabulary or consciousness of, of planners. Um, we had the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, which was compelling us to take on people-centered approaches to disaster risk reduction, but there were no tools that told us, how do you do that? How, how can you be people-centered uh, in managing disaster risk? So we've been building uh, together with people with disability, the services that support them, and emergency personnel, the tools that will help us uh, to achieve those outcomes. Six years later, we're making a pretty sustainable impact. Not only do we have the co-designed tools, but we have the rule books and the requirements for action. Uh, these are embedded now in Australia's new national disability strategy that for the first time requires disability inclusive emergency planning. And in the National Disability Insurance Scheme Quality and Safeguarding uh, Legislative Amendment, which requires service providers to engage in uh, emergency management and disaster planning, which wasn't there before. And there are new practice standards that guide service providers in taking on this role. So how did we get from an idea to legislative change? Um, it was through participatory methodologies, and we combined uh, the knowledge to action process, which consists of a knowledge creation funnel of inquiry, co-production, and continuous evaluation, together with an action cycle where we overlay appreciative inquiry. We look for the best of what's already working in communities and amplify that upward. Um, we engage with multiple stakeholders through multiple iterations of these cycles in the co-design of the products and tools that people can use and that are accessible for people with disability uh, to be a part of the conversation from the beginning. What does this actually look like in practice? It's really about learning together. We bring people who do not normally work together to have genuine and open conversations. Uh, we boldly confront the gaps that people with disability face and we have the hard conversations and we provide the emotional support uh, for the well-being that accompanies some of those really difficult and challenging discussions. Mostly we facilitate shared learning about the potential role and the contributions that different stakeholders can play and we solve those problems uh, through designing tools that will actually help us work better together. And what we do as a research team is we support and sustain this interaction among the different stakeholders over time and at multiple levels. When we co-design our tools, we put them in a space where everyone can access them. And so on this slide, you will see the Collaborating for Inclusion uh, website, which is regularly updated with the, the tools that we're co-producing together. And I'd encourage people to, to go visit and start using them. We now have two pretty solid programs of research that are sort of front and center in the focus of what we do. One is putting disability inclusive disaster risk reduction in action at a community level. So engaging in inclusive emergency planning and disaster recovery uh, planning practices and processes that will make sure they're inclusive of people with disability from the outset so that we can respond better to the extra support needs of people with disability when disasters strike. And we have, I should say that that program of research is really targeting our obligations and supporting people uh, under Australia's new national disability strategy and looking at meeting our requirements under the new targeted action plan for disability inclusive emergency planning. Um, our other program of research really focuses on person-centered emergency preparedness in action. So if we can put tools for enabling individual preparedness into the hands of people who need to make a plan and plan around their extra support needs, um, how, can we, how can we resolve what that looks like when there are continuous gaps in those plans that need support and action? So this program of research um, starts with individual and person-centered self-assessment and leads to cross-sector collaborative action to bring uh, people together with emergency services and the community disability and healthcare services that support them to learn together to create more um, helpful plans for emergency situations. 
Before closing, I'd like to share a few reflections on some of the things we're learning by boldly going into complex spaces to solve these, uh, a really unsolvable challenge. Uh, we can do it in a few ways. One is to recognize that the vulnerability approach does not work. Um, we need to actually take uh, a capability approach in order to take disability out of the too hard basket. When we view people with disability as capable and we bring them into the conversation, we can resolve a lot of the challenges that they experience and that put their health, safety and well-being at risk in disaster situations. The tools we use direct how we work. So if we don't embed inclusion into the tools and if we don't embed cross-sector collaborative working into those tools, then we won't get those outputs. So the tools that we build together really um, look at how do we empower people to take responsibility for their plans and put those plans into action through collaboration. And lastly, true partnership actually requires genuine acts of humility. So Christy and Peter was a great uh, example of the kinds of change that happens when people come together to promote uh, inclusive uh, disaster planning. And I'll end there, thank you. Thanks, Michelle. So I think um, what you've heard from, from our three speakers, and, and thank you very much to, to Josh, to Andrew and Michelle, has probably just scratched the surface. Um, you know, they've given us some really good ideas and, and some, um, some context around some of the challenges and why this is indeed a wicked problem. And I think to, to reflect on that, you know, most disaster preparation that we see um, in the engagement programs target people who live full time in residential housing, are well connected to information services and sources. Um, but many people don't fit into that, that sort of category at any given time. And, and Josh has spoken about that, particularly people are on the move. They, they, they go for work, they go for family reasons, it could be for cultural reasons uh, and a whole range of things, including students. Uh, and we have students that go and do field work that will find themselves in places that they're not necessarily familiar with. Others still have living arrangements that are more transient uh, that, that results in them having um, no permanent home, they might be less connected with the broader community and less accessible. Uh, and we also know that these less socially connected, those people who are less socially connected in their communities tend to suffer the most when disasters occur. Um, and the real question is how do we engage with people like that that are mobile, that are on the move, uh, and really um, in many ways are not accessible to the sort of traditional ways that we go about doing things. So the challenge, really trying to get into that and see what bright ideas there are as ways to do it. There might be people listening today who, who think they might either be part of one of those groups that we don't, can't communicate with well, or they, they live with or know or have, have family members who fit into that group. You know, those people that have lived experiences probably have some awesome ideas and really we're trying to give you an opportunity to share those with us. So the challenge itself um, has two parts. The first part of the challenge, which we're in at the moment, is really to pitch the concept to us. We want to hear your team's idea for addressing the wicked problem, and, and we certainly do encourage teams to participate uh, and for those teams to be made up of people from different backgrounds of different, um, different university education to really give it a breadth to, to what's being put forward. And, and that pitch can be uh, written um, or as a video, as a short video, and the information for that is on the website at disasterchallenge.com.au. From that, there will be some finalists that are selected and they will be supported to bring their ideas to life. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Um, so what the teams need to do for phase one, and these are, are really just some thoughts to get you started. Um, you really need to go about putting, thinking through what you're trying to do. We need to know which engaged, moving or hard to reach group that you think your approach will benefit benefit it doesn't need to be all of them you can say you know for the pitch that I've got I think this is the group of people that I can I can I and we and our ideas can most um, help they need to address the wicked problem so how how are we going to do that what what is our approach that would see this being resolved um, then to explain then how that approach will improve disaster safety um, or build resilience to that group of people so that they are less impacted and to think about how we could measure the benefit of this new approach. So if we did it, if we introduced what you're thinking, how would we know whether it's worked or not? Because that, that is one of the challenges that having new ideas is great, but being able to demonstrate that they've got a benefit is much, much harder at times. And it's, it's the ability to demonstrate that benefit will get the traction and get this, um, those ideas um, 
out there to be used and to be implemented as part of business as usual for people that need to share information at an appropriate time. The second phase of, of that for the finalist is all about bringing the ideas to life. In, that, in this part of the program, the finalists will be linked with relevant mentors, both from, from within a, the university sector, but also from, from the, what we'd call the industry. It could be from local government, could be from emergency services, could be from um, NGOs like Red Cross, to really help the teams develop, refine and test their idea, to, to, to look at, make sure that it's robust and that, that they've really thought through all the elements of it, to determine how best to bring that idea to life. And, and through that process, there will be access to support uh, through our centre, through Natural Hazards Research Australia and the mentors. And that can include some contribution to out-of-pocket costs if we need to, but things like um, design work um, and, and bringing, bringing that idea to life so that when, it, when you get to the final pitch, that you've, you've got a reasonable representation of how this could work uh, if it was successful and if it was introduced into getting the information out to people who, who really are struggling to get that information uh, in a timely manner in the way that we communicate at the moment. So for the pitch itself, uh, team representatives from each of the finalists will pitch their developed ideas in Brisbane on Thursday the 13th of October uh, this year, 2022. Uh, that is the United Nations International Day for Disaster Risk Reduction. And the, the program, the uh, Disaster Challenge will cover travel and accommodation costs for non-Brisbane teams or representatives of those teams to participate in that day. Uh, and for anyone that knows that picture is not Brisbane, that is uh, St Kilda Beach in Melbourne. So uh, if you're a Queenslander, please don't so I think I got it wrong. Um, important dates, the, the program is open and it's accepting um, pictures as we speak. Those entries need to be submitted by the 30th of June. So you still have six weeks to do that. Uh, the finalist will be announced by on or by the 11th of July this year, and those finalists will have up until the 13th of October to develop, refine, and prepare their pitch for the final presentation. Um, and we're looking forward, we genuinely are really looking forward to hearing those new ideas and looking where we can go. I, I should mention also that the disaster challenge has been coordinated with a working group from, uh, from Queensland, uh, and those uh, organisations are identified on the slide at the moment on the right hand side. Um, now it's question time. So we've sort of gone through and tried to give you a bit of an overview of the program, our expectations of, of where it's going. Um, we've got uh, a few of our, our um, working group. We've got Alison Riffey from the Inspector General's Office in, in of Emergency Management in Queensland. We have Lisa Schuster from Queensland University of Technology and we have Michael um, Carroll from Queensland Fire and Emergency Services who have now joined us. Uh, if you have the q and I'm going to stop sharing my screen now so that we can I can see what's going on. We have a few questions coming through. We have some other, other questions that have popped up from various places. Um, I'm going to get a question. I think we've got Michelle still online. And, and the first question is really um, a quick question about the frameworks and studies mentioned that, that I mentioned, Michelle mentioned, requiring accurate assessment of travel demand and time aftermath, a disaster in which cascading failures take place. Is there any ongoing study and or centralised system to gather near real-time data on cascading failures and their effects on a network? I reckon, Michelle, that's a really good question for you to have wow. a go at. That, well, there, isn't that a good question for this yes. disaster challenge potentially? I think maybe we could we could workshop that question into something mm. quite fabulous. Mm. Um, you know what? I think what we have, unfortunately, I think the the real problem we have for people with disability, and that's what I'll speak to specifically. We actually don't have data on people with disability. We have um, lists. Um, haphazard, not necessarily well kept, and that are not necessarily representative of people with disability on those lists. We also, uh, because we don't actually know uh, what people can do for themselves or what they need support for, and because lists that do exist are ineffective, uh, we actually don't have data and information that would tell us, you know, what's the situation for people with disability in emergencies. So that's what our program of research is. First, building the tools so that we can um, collect logical data about that risk. One of the examples I always give is it's not really helpful to know that someone has a spinal injury 
but it's really helpful to know if they have problems trans with transportation in an evacuation. Mm -hmm. So it's about first building the language so that we can construct the right tool. So it's a great question. And I think it would be really good to be working toward how do we develop this in a centralized database accessible to multiple stakeholders when and where they need it. And I think that's one of the challenges we've got in natural hazards research per se and moving forward that the data is, is fragmented at times and we don't have all that we need. So yeah, that, but that, that was a really good question to start off with. Uh, and I might just, uh, Alison Rufai, I know, has joined us now. Alison, from where you sit in Inspector General's office, um, how do you find you know, that that question, I think, is, is quite a compelling question in the lack of data. What, what's the perspective from your, from where you sit? I think something that always comes up, hopefully you can hear me, I've got wireless earphones yeah. on. Um, something that always comes up is the issue of privacy and of sharing those kind of things. And we know that different, um, for example, with, with um, disability service providers, they know who their clients are. And there's always that fear about sharing those details um, you know, during, before an emergency. We know that the, the previous IGEM had discussions with the privacy commissioner about that it's okay to share that kind of data during a disaster situation. Mm -hmm. you're covered you're not you're not you know putting anyone at risk so I think we've still got some barriers around that as well that need to be addressed um that sort of thing and it, I mean data and points of truth for data are always a, a source of challenge during operational events so the more that we can share and have those discussions beforehand the, the better things will, will be hopefully yeah thank you um now, the question from Barb Ryan just looking some clarification um is it it is to find ways to connect with people in a certain group to motivate preparation, behaviour, resilience, and build the preparation, behaviour, resilience, building that group. The answer is yes. It is how how do we how can we uh, encourage and support people to take action that will help them um, save their lives, to reduce their impact, and to seek help and support where they can in advance. It's far easier to do some of these things um, before we have a disaster event come through because once the impact has come through, it is actually so much harder to, to help people. Yes, it can lead, in the case of people who are sleeping rough to loss of life uh, and, and feeling significant health issues. So it is about that piece before an event comes. How do we help to, to do that? And it, it doesn't need to be in the day before that happens. It could be a week, a month or several months beforehand if we do it. So it's wide open into how you think you could go about that. Um, Kim Johnston asked a question about are there constraints on ideas budget timeframe. Uh, there's no constraints on ideas at all. Any idea is welcome. Um, but yes, there are some constraints on, on budget and time. I mean, the, the time, what, what we're looking for out of the disaster challenge is to demonstrate how well the idea could work. We're not looking uh, either in the, the phase one. In the phase one, we're wanting you to be able to describe how you would go about it. So you're trying to enthuse and excite us, uh, the working group and the Natural Hazards Research Australia team to, to be able to listen and hear what you've got, whether, whether it's written or, or through a video and say, I get that. I understand the group that's being challenged and damn, that's a good idea. So, so it's trying to, to help us understand how you think you can solve that problem. Uh, for the pitch for the, for the phase two, um, yes, there's not an unending budget and we're not expecting it to be a final uh, final uh, go to market product at the end again it's it's giving it's breathing life into things it could be looking at animations it could be looking at videos it could be looking at some collateral that goes out there in printed material um, it's really to, to get it to a point where you might call it a beta version that that's being used to um, to, to really share the idea and go from that and beyond that you know where there's scope to to support more work we'll look at that and, and uh, take that on board towards the end of the program now i've got a question i've got lisa i've at least had a camera on and lisa schuster has turned her camera off from qut um, the question was really um you know someone thought you know the great presentations amazing projects how do we reach out to people who might want to team up so i guess you know you said it at qut if people want to form a, a team ooh, now Lisa has gone green for a moment. <laughs> She's back. Um, so question, you know, how, how do you go about it? If you have students that would like to, to form a team, postgraduates and early career researchers, what's your advice on that? Okay, your, your microphone's not working at the moment. So uh, so maybe if, if, you, if you can type an answer into the Q&A on that one, maybe if we can't work through the technology. 
um, is one, one of the, the things that's been a little bit hard for us over, over COVID. And, and just, just using that as a, a catch to go into COVID, um, Andrew's commentary around people who are lost in space, I hadn't contemplated those people before in this whole disaster space. And, and I guess that, that there are Australians that are caught overseas, but there's potentially people who are non-Australians who are caught in Australia who are lost in space as well. So you know, they're, they're, this is not a, a fixed space. The, the people that are difficult to communicate with is, is constant and it's moving. Um, question was, does the pitch have to be about people with disability or, or can it be any related topic? It doesn't need to be to do with disability. Disability is just an example. Uh, we're looking at, at people who are and can be hard to contact, difficult. It may be people who've gone bush um, that, that really don't have any means of communication. So how do you get to them before that? It could be um, people who have moved from the cities during COVID and, and really don't understand where they're at. It could be any number of people. So no, disability was an example. It's certainly not um, a boundary for the program. So I might um, go back to Josh, if you're there, Josh, just to get your thoughts. If you've, you've heard some of the questions, you've got a wealth of experience in, in doing things. And I think you know, one of the interesting things always is human behavior. And you know, we've not really touched on that directly, but you know, people make decisions. And, and I think you know, when I think about how people respond and react to things, we often talk about evacuation. Um, and I, in my mind, I think I tend to think about there's evacuation, which is all planned and orderly and all those sort of things. You do that because you've done stuff and there's escape and escape happens when everything is falling down on you. The fire's on your doorstep, the floodwater's washing you away and you're trying to escape. Really different. Yeah, uh, I think um, th there's a range of, of issues there um, around uh, leaving early, which has always been the advice for for bushfires, if you're going to leave, you need to leave early um, to prevent some of those challenges like power outages and telecommunications outages, preventing you from receiving warnings and information that could be critical to your safety. Um, I, I'd also say, you know, reflecting on something you said earlier, John, which is that we've always tended to focus on where people live as, as the basis of our planning. Um, and Andrew's presentation really, um, you know, fly in, fly out, for example. The other thing um, is, you know, I talked about tourists and visitors. The other thing is, well, where are people during the day? Do we have dormitory suburbs during the day? What's the implications of that? And we know that with bushfires, for example, it's not just people coming out, it's people coming back in. So we saw that uh, in particular in the 2017 uh, bushfires on the outskirts of, of Canberra and Queanbeyan, where people received warnings and tried to get home. So this idea of movement, it's not just people moving out, it's people moving in. Um, one of the questions that you had was around sort of data around where people are. I mean, I think that's a really interesting question. We have technology that tracks us, that records where we are at different points in the day. And that's all, um, fair game for planning now if we can access that data so um, i think it's it's we need to shift our planning for emergencies to where people are uh, in the over the course of the day and at different times of the year and capture some of that mobility in our planning um, tourists in summer is one but right down to that sort of diurnal daily movement where you've got you know we looked at a, a for a risk plan that we we're working on the other day uh, around 70 percent of working aged residents leave that lga that local government area um, for work so what are the implications of that for risk these are the sorts of things that i think where we have planning and policy but we've got new technologies and new data that could be really brought to that process to better understand how people are acting, where they might be in an emergency um, or a disaster. And uh, you know, with that information, we can make better decisions about how we plan for their safety. 
Thanks, Josh. Uh, there's a question in here just looking at um, eligibility criteria and who can participate in the program. The, the, the intent of the program is we really try to develop people who are early in their research careers. So they are people doing PhDs, postgraduate research uh, and early career researchers up to five years post PhD. So if that's not you, um, th there are potentially roles for you to support the team as a mentor in all of those things. So I think be a little bit creative, but you know, we are, it is very much trying to develop people who, who uh, are relatively early in their research career to encourage them. Um, and, and from our perspective, it's a, the research in natural hazards is, is really rewarding. Uh, there's a lot of benefit you can have. You can improve public health outcomes. You can improve safety. You can, you can help communities be resilient and vibrant and, and really try to help that happen. Um, the deadline for submitting ideas, the, the first phase, which is putting your, your concept to us, needs to be submitted by the 30th of June. Um, the finalists will be announced on the 11th of July and that, that, that group, for those finalists, there will be three or four finalists that come through depending on the quality of, of submissions that we get. Uh, and the final pitch will be on the 13th of October. Uh, going through some other questions, um, a great a question here say or comment that a great deal of these requirements are written into the building code but are ignored or misunderstood. How do researchers engage with the industry without bringing pain and reluctance? That is a, another wicked question that we're sort of working our way through at the moment. Um, some of these questions, some of the wicked questions are very, very challenging for us and, and um, probably going to be resolved through longer term research, but we'll, we'll consider those for future challenges as well. Um, there was a, a comment that Annabelle Murray from Annabelle, Annabelle Murray that's working with traditional owners. Um, we're going to share information. Absolutely, I think we're, we're looking for ideas from everywhere and, and Australia has such a rich fabric of, uh, of people and, and thinking. So the, the more that we can engage with that, the better. Uh, we'd be very much supportive of that. Um, going through, I, I think just before I go on with some other questions, um, I might pass to or, or ask Michael Carroll from Queensland Fire and Emergency Services a question. Hey, Michael, yesterday um, I had the privilege of being at QFES for a workshop looking at um, what climate change might do and how that's going to challenge things. You know, we've got, got a whole lot of systems that are working at the moment. And, and I think climate change provides a bit of a curveball because it's going to change what people think can happen and we're going to see some new things. What, what from a from an emergency services perspective, what does that mean for you? Do you think? And I think if you can, you're still on mute at the moment. Um, so, guys, at the back end, can you take Michael off mute for me? Is that possible? Oh, no. Okay. So we'll, we'll, we'll come back to you, Michael, if we can get that to work. Sorry about that. Um, so there's a question from uh, Blythe McLennan asking whether teams can propose an innovative process to identify ways to engage better with the target group as a solution to this challenge, um, or will they need to design, develop an engagement method by the end of the challenge? Um, I think what we need to try and do is to, to identify what the solution looks like and to, to, to have that so we can put it out there and it can be looked at and explored by people like Michael and his colleagues at QFES and by Josh and his colleagues at the Rural Fire, uh, Rural Fire Service in New South Wales. Um, they don't need to have worked out how it will be rolled out, but what we need to do, and I, I guess, imagine that you're presenting it to a group of peers and, and they've got to choose between four, three or four approaches. Um, we need enough information to get a sense of how you see it working, to, to look at the benefit, to, to be able to assess the benefit that it could have. But it, it doesn't need to be fully refined. We don't necessarily need to see how it will be rolled out. Uh, hopefully that helps answer that question. Um, will you be providing a copy of this to, for us to review later? So if that's recurred, re referring Scott to the, the, um, the presentation, yes, this recording will be made available online. And to the extent that that there are other questions, um, pop them through the contact details to research at naturalhazards.com.au and we'll address those where we can. Um, master's students are eligible to apply. Yes, absolutely. And we'd love to have your role there. Um, and there's an anonymous person says, if I have an adjunct role at a university and just finished my PhD in natural disasters decision-making and wish to put in my concept as a sole researcher, 
is this meeting the eligibility criteria? Yes, it is. Um, we do actively encourage groups of people because that allows you uh, to have a team around you to test ideas. But um, yes, you, you can put in um, a solved thing if you like. Um, you know, that, that is up to you. Um, but you know, again, we, we encourage active participation. We're almost at the end. I might just pass to uh, our presenters. Michelle, was there anything you'd like to say, having listened to this? I know it's been sort of fast paced through the questions towards the end. Any thoughts you've got just before we wrap up? Well, this is pretty exciting and the questions really show the enthusiasm that people have, but I suppose one reflection I have as I listen to all the questions is to try to be careful about scope and scope creep um, in the projects I suppose that you propose and at the, the level at which this challenge is sort of beginning to address. Um, and I wonder if that's a helpful way for people to think about managing the scope so that they can manage both their, their individual and team process in this. It's very exciting. I can't wait to see what transpires. Yeah, thank you. And I think that that's really good advice for people that are interested. You don't have to try and solve all the problems in one. Pick a, sp a particular problem that you think you can resolve. That would be an awesome outcome for us. And, and you know, a lot of times in natural hazards research, even, even improving the outcomes for a single individual is an awesome outcome. So don't think it's going to be hundreds or thousands of people that you're benefiting. You just think, think small, think achievable and, and, and really understand what you're trying to do. So thank you, Michelle. Josh, um, I think you're still with us. You, any final thoughts from you? Yeah, look, I think this uh, this challenge, this question is a really interesting one. How do we engage the, the unengaged, the hard to reach, the people who are on the move? Because I think so much of the, the community engagement work that all fire and emergency services do is, um, if not targeted to, then most impactful with the already engaged. So how do we get the bulk of the population who don't want to think about bushfires or floods or whatever, um, whatever challenge it is we're, we're dealing with? So I think there's a real opportunity to think outside the box, uh, to think about how we, um, how we engage the unengaged. And, you know, I like, I like that idea of, um, that, that uh, Michelle mentioned about um, having a look at what's working in communities and then amplifying it. I think that's... Uh, that's that's a real opportunity um, and an exciting one. Yeah, no, thank you. And there was a question, um, is there a maximum team size? No, there's not. Um, with the final, if you've got a team of 10, when we're not in a position to fly all 10 up and we representatives of the team, but what you want to have is a, a team that works for you so that the representation is an appropriate size. Um, so that we're there. Uh, there is a question, can, we, can you provide us with a forum to form teams? Uh, I'll take that on notice, I'm not sure with that. Uh, but certainly if you are, you know, a number of universities have got people that they've identified who uh, will do that. I know Barb Ryan has done that uh, up at her university, um, taken on notice. Um, and a question, are you looking for place-based approaches that have already worked and could become broad systemic change within the, the EM sector, i.e. government solution? I guess what we're looking for is the innovation that takes something that is um, not already being being used and rolled out in emergency management. So if it's something that you've observed that people are just doing that can be picked up, then that would certainly be something that, that we're interested in. If uh, in the Queensland context, the disaster management group or elsewhere in the country, a local government or a, um, a fire or other emergency service is doing something but just needs to be scaled up, there'd need to be an innovative part to that. Um, so hopefully that helps with that one. And I might, um, for, for a last comment, I might go to Lisa Schuster uh, at QUT. Uh, Lisa, you sit inside a university. How do we how do we encourage people to do this? And and you know, are there some ways that students can find someone relatively easily? Oh, you're on. I haven't got you. Oh no, I've come back to you and you haven't got set. So look, I, I apologise for putting Lisa in that that position, Ian. I forgot that her microphone wasn't working, uh, and to Michael, I apologise as well because we got him and we couldn't get him off mute. Um, I, I would have hoped, expected that after two and a half years of doing this because of COVID, we'd have it nailed. But I think you know it's one of those things. But you know, he's also a really good reminder for us as we go into thinking about this challenge that if we assume that one means of communicating with someone is going to work and it breaks, we have a problem and that does happen. And um, you know, Josh has done a number of research 
uh, pieces of research for us in the past. And, and one of those was people that lived in a place that just was expecting to get communication on the radio or, or expecting to get communication through SMS on their phone and it didn't come. So what is the backup for that one? So I, I think whilst I, I do apologize to those folks that were, were joining us and hoping to share their views, it is also a really good reminder to, um, to not become reliant on some of those single solutions. So with that, thank you everyone for participating. It's, it's now five o'clock down here on the, or across here on the East Coast of Australia. We're really looking forward to having um, submissions from as many groups and individuals as we can. It's an exciting time for us. I think, um, I don't think, Andrew, did you have any last thing that you wanted to add before we go? Oh, sorry, John, I was just popping up to say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. And look, I appreciate Josh and Andrew and Michelle for, the, for their presentation today. So thank you, everybody. We'll be looking to get this presentation up on the website as soon as we can. So it should be there within the next week, if not quicker. And if you do have any questions, uh, they can be sent through to um, research at naturalhazards.com.au. And for information on the disaster challenge, go to disasterchallenge.com.au. And really looking forward to hearing your ideas and to meeting the finalists in Queensland in October. Thank you, everyone, and have a good evening.